Kenny and his wife Susan came to our church more than two years ago and became a vital a part of the ministries here, all kinds of different things. Not too long ago, Kenny lost his best friend and lifelong partner, Susan, when she died suddenly. And he is leaving this week to go and join his brother, who also lost his wife just 18 days before Susan. And they're going to support each other yes. in Colorado, yes. right? So he also said that he was baptized as a baby, but he's never had believer's baptism. And so right now, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise him. based upon a very popular movie that started showing in theaters, not this past Friday, but Friday a week ago. Um, I am not promoting the, the movie nor the book on which the movie is based. Instead, I'm discouraging people from going and seeing the movie Fifty Shades of Grey. All right, yes. um, because it promotes and espouses things that are counter to what the Bible has to say. But the title of my sermon today is called Shades of Grey. Go ahead and run that video, brother.
there are many questionable behaviors that fall into what we might call gray areas. And so shades of gray is shades of gray is the title for this sermon. There are some things that the Bible doesn't directly address, issues that Christians have debated over the years. When I was young, and we've mentioned this before, when I was young, uh, that was a long time ago, but when I was young, um, women did not wear pants to church. Amen. It was, it was, it was, it was completely unacceptable right. for women to wear pants to church. There, was, there were certain kinds of music that I was not allowed to listen to as a child. Um, but the Bible never really spoke directly to or about those things. Um, things like what a Christian should or should not do on Sunday. We know that, that the Sabbath is not Sunday, it's Saturday. We also know that the Old Testament has lots of prohibitions on certain things to eat and drink that may or may not apply to us as Christians today. There's also certain kinds of recreation that may be appropriate. Again, when I was a kid and we went to summer camp, the, the, the young men and the young women did not go swimming at the same time. Okay, I'm not saying that that's, that's inappropriate or appropriate. What I'm saying is, is the Bible doesn't speak about what, what, who goes swimming when Amen. on Amen. that. But today we're going to be talking about what building a healthy marriage involves. And building a healthy marriage is more than simply not cheating. I believe that it requires gospel-centered work in these little gray areas of life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he says these things, all things are lawful for me. Boy, we cannot see that at all. Can no, okay, you can see it up here, can't you? Can you read that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but not all things are helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Uh -huh. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Yes. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We live in a world today that, that we are literally inundated, bombarded, if you will, with sexual innuendos. You don't have to go to explicit channels on your television to see explicit stuff. You just have to turn on any network program in prime time and very likely you will see it. If you don't see it in the program itself, you'll see it in the commercials. I mean, we use sex to sell everything in this country today. Um, Hardy's has done an amazing job of selling hamburgers with sexual innuendos. I, I, have, I fail to see what the correlation is there, but if it works, I guess that's, that's for them to decide. But the truth is, is that, is that our world today is really messed up in its understanding of sex. But sex sells. Advertising firms know this or they wouldn't use it. But you, literally it's everywhere enticing people, I believe, into 
looking further than just what they see on television, many into pornography itself. With the advent of the internet, it's possible to get to hardcore pornography with just a few clicks of a mouse. But you don't have to go that far. Again, just turn on your television and you'll see it. But you need to hear this. Sex was not created by Satan. That's right. That's right. It was not created by Playboy. <laughs> Sex was not created by Hollywood. Amen. Nor was it created by HBO or by rock musicians or by the internet. Sex was created by the holy God of heaven Amen. where purity reigns. Yes. God made sex physically desirable by creating us with sexual drives without which sex wouldn't exist and neither would people. Amen. So sex is good. God created it. God called it good and it existed before there was any sin in the world. We should not be ashamed to talk about what God wasn't ashamed to create. Amen. But God designed sex for the sacred union of marriage and reserves it for that union. Yes. It is both the means by which children are conceived, something very close to God's heart, I believe, and a means by which marital intimacy is expressed and cultivated. And when it takes its place in its proper context, God is definitely pro-sex. But any other expressions outside of marriage are a perversion of what God has created. Yeah. And because of the danger of this perversion, we are told to remain sexually pure. Amen. Why should we remain sexually pure? God's Word tells us. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5 says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That's right. And also in Ephesians 5, 3 through 4, we read these words, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Amen. The biggest reason we should remain sexually pure is because what we do with our bodies either honors or dishonors God. Yes. So my first point here is that purity honors God. God. Purity honors God. Anyone can remain sexually pure until marriage by putting their mind into the things of God and setting a commitment in their heart to do so. Amen. But for some reason, and I don't understand this, for some reason, Christians have stopped thinking that they're accountable to God for their actions. Because of this, we are no longer a purifying influence on the world. But instead, we've allowed the world to drag us down to its standard. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this, For you were bought with a price. We just read that. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price, and so you belong to God. When we become, when we become a Christian, that means that we're a new person. Yes. Reborn in Jesus Christ, the old has passed away, and the new creation has come. It's a transformation that takes place of our heart and our mind and our soul within us. We repent, we become saved, and God blesses us with His resources to keep us protected from the world of temptation. To, reborn, to be reborn in Christ means that we died to the sins that were controlling us. To continue in sexual impurity, or what the Bible calls fornication, is to deny Christ's control over us. Pastor Vance, would you take Kenny's coat to him back there in my office? I think he didn't have a dry shirt, so he needs something to put on so he can come out here. Amen. To continue in sexual impurity, or what the Bible calls fornication, is simply to deny Christ's control over us. 
And if we continue in this type of sin, in fact, that's a legitimate reason to question whether or not we've truly ever been born again. Sanctification, which, which is literally purification, is the process by which we become more and more like Christ. It's an essential, it is an essential evidence of the reality of our salvation. So, sexual purity then is a total commitment of our sexual needs, our desires, our thoughts, and our actions to God. You see, a Christian should never view sexuality and ask this question, how far from purity can I wander before I've sinned? How far from purity can I wander before I've sinned? Rather, a Christian perspective guides us towards purity and, and causes us to seek it in our attitudes and actions. <clears throat> so it's clear that for Christians, the question is not how far can I go, but rather how best can I honor God? Amen. Number two, the boundaries of sex are the boundaries of marriage. The boundaries of sex are the boundaries of marriage. Sex and marriage go together. Sexual union is intended as an expression of a lifelong commitment, a symbol of the spiritual union that exists only within the unconditional commitment of marriage. Apart from marriage, the lasting commitment is absent and the sexual acts become a fault expression false expression, a lie. So every act of sex outside of marriage cheapens both sex and marriage. Uh -huh. Say that. You see, sex is a privilege that's inseparable from the responsibility of sacred marriage and the sacred marriage covenant. To exercise the privilege apart from the responsibility perverts God's intention for sex. But you hear people say, but, but Pastor, we really love each other. I hear that a lot from couples in love. But you see, that has no bearing whatsoever on the ethics of sexual intimacy. Amen. Sex does not become permissible through subjective feelings, well, no. but through the objective, lifelong commitment of marriage. Yes. But hear this, even after we are married, even after we are married, we must maintain sexual purity. Yes. So ultimately, protecting your marriage and your relationship with your spouse is a heart issue. Yes, say that. The biggest threat to your marriage is a four-letter word called lust. That's right. As Christians, we cannot entertain it even a little bit. Listen, I'm not naive. I know that it's culturally acceptable to look at or read something that may cause us to lust, just as long as we're not physically cheating on our spouse. But Jesus clarifies this one thing in Matthew 5, 27 to 30. He said this, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that the whole body go into hell. Listen, lust is not your friend. Amen. If you invite lust over for a visit, before you know it, he's moved into the spare bedroom, right. and then he's overtaken your entire house. So what are a few practical steps that you can take to protect yourself from lust? Well, I've got a few of these here. Let's list them. First one is consistent prayer. Consistent prayer is the first one. Listen, lift up your desires and feelings and ask God's help in dealing with those. Instead of giving in to the lustful thoughts and feelings, give it over to God. God made you and He knows you and can deliver you time and time again. That's right. Okay? 
P is, is, is almost a no-brainer, and yet it seems to be so pervasive in our society that it's become acceptable. But this is, number two, is to avoid pornography. Amen. Besides the obvious reason that avoiding porn will help guard against lust, there are psychological reasons as well. Because pornography creates un unrealistic expectation, and it desensitizes our minds toward our spouses. They can't possibly live up to what is viewed, and would we even want them to live up to that? That's right. That's right. But to push the focus of your sexual desires outside of the home can only lead to paths of destruction. Amen. Number three, practice sexual intimacy. <laughs> Listen, do you remember falling in love and that feeling that nobody in the world existed except the person that you love? The reason for that is that there was a high level of intimacy that was shared while you were getting to know each other. And while there is no reset button to start the marital relationship over, there are certain plenty of ways to regain that level of intimacy. Improving communication, date nights, passionate kissing, yes, and thoughtful gestures are just a few examples. When our minds and our hearts are occupied in the right place, sexual lust has little room to operate. Amen. The fourth one is avoid tempting situations. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want to do is find yourself alone with the object of your lustful desires. Mm -hmm. If contact with that person is a must, then make sure it's always in a public space with other people Amen. around. Don't paint yourself into a corner for further action might be possible. And number five, choose your friends wisely. Amen. When battling lust, there are plenty of people who can, you can find who will enable that lust to grow even more powerful. You may have friends that are single, who are living uh, that lifestyle, or who are married but are cheating, and who are drawn to trouble. You can still be their friends, but by all means, avoid joining them in the choices that they make. Amen. The third point of the sermon is this. Husbands and wives should be agents of grace in their spouse's life. Husbands and wives should be agents of grace in their spouse's life. Ephesians 5, 25 to 33 gives us this word. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Amen. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Amen. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Listen. If the husband fulfills his marital responsibilities, uh -huh. what does that do for the wife? Amen. Simply speaking, I believe that it helps them both to be sanctified just like Christ sanctified us. Yes. So marriage can be a way for each of us to help sanctify our spouses. Amen. Here are a few ways that you can help to sanctify your spouse. First, put your spouse first above yourself. The picture here is sacrifice, and it is the understanding that to sanctify means literally to set apart for special use, as in something that we might consecrate. So we need to honor our spouses, not among lots of other people, but before and above everyone else. The second thing that I would suggest is that you gospel your spouse. Now, I realize that the word gospel is not a verb, but I think you may get my meaning here. The passage we just read said Jesus sanctifies the church by washing her with the water of the word. 
The understanding of sanctify as cleanse is in view here. And a husband who wants to sanctify his wife will share her with her the word of God. Speak to her the word of God. Remind her who she is in Christ. Forgive her sins and give her the opportunity to forgive his in genuine repentance. And in general, make sure that she's gently, lovingly covered in the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Gospel your wife. Yes. Yes. Number three, protect your spouse. Yes. When you're around others, do you speak highly of your spouse? Or do you complain about your spouse, pointing out his or her faults in the presence of others? Listen, we need to take on the responsibility to protect not only our spouse's reputation, but also to protect our spouse from sin and sin's temptation, yes. sin's accusations, sin's attacks, and the unnecessary burdens and hurtful ex expectations and assumptions of sin. The fourth thing I would recommend is to become a servant to your spouse. How did Jesus position himself over the church as its head? By becoming a servant to it. Sacrificing to the point of death in loving service to her betterment. We need to follow Christ's example and become a servant to our spouse. The bottom line in all of this with regard to the gray areas of life is that there are things that the Bible clearly addresses and these you can know clearly what to do but here but the Bible also um, will keep you away from sinning but, but I'm going to give you a short test to apply with regard to behavior in the gray areas write down these three questions this is important the first one is is it edifying the word edification in the Greek means to build up. As such, it is the act of one who promotes another in their growth and their Christian faith. So, is what you are considering something that will edify you or another brother or sister in Christ? If the answer is yes, and it does not go against God's word, then you have the freedom to do it. But, if it will tear down or diminish your faith or the faith of another, and you should avoid it. The second question you should ask yourself is, can it lead to bondage or addiction? This is important because we know that we have freedom in Christ, but that does not mean that everything is good for us. Addiction can be captured in the statement, when you want to say no, but you can't. I had a soldier, when I was a chaplain on active duty, I had a soldier that came to me once and he said, I could never be a Christian. When I asked him why, he said, there's no freedom in Christianity. <laughs> and then he started naming all the things that he would have to give up if he became a Christian. So after he finished making his list, I asked him, if you're so free, then stop doing all those things that make you feel liberated. After thinking about that for a minute, he said that he neither wanted to stop and that even if he did want to stop, very likely he couldn't stop doing it. My reply then is, so you're not as free as you claim to, claim to be. That's right. Amen. He was not living in freedom. He was living in bondage. The third one of these, the third question to ask is, will it cause someone else to stumble in their faith? Just because we're free in Christ doesn't mean we can do whatever we want to do. That's right. If what we are wanting to do causes our brother or sister in Christ to stumble in their faith, then we shouldn't do it. 1 Corinthians 8 9 tells us this clearly. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Let me give you a little scenario. Imagine that you invited someone over to your house. And let's suppose that while this person was visiting you, that a skunk appeared outside your house and something startled that skunk and it gave off its scent. <clears throat> and as you're sitting there talking to your friend, the smell begins to enter your home. Well, you immediately reach for the air freshener and start to spray the room to get rid of that awful smell. But you notice that your guest begins coughing and can barely breathe. 
you recognize that the, the person who's visiting you is having an allergic reaction and their airway is quickly closing. So what would you do? Would you keep spraying the house until the skunk scent is all gone? Or would you stop spraying the house with the freshener and help your friend by whatever means necessary to get them to the hospital? Or would you look at your friend, and this, sometimes we do this in, in Christianity, we, you would look at your friend and wonder why he or she does not have enough faith to overcome the air freshener. Uh -huh. <laughs> or you may let the friend know that you're sorry the air freshener offends them, but you have every right to spray your house to make it smell good. Hopefully, this is not a situation that you find yourself in and that, that, that we would get our friend to the hospital as soon as possible. But you see, this sort of thing happens all the time in our faith. Because of a twisted perception of what being free in Christ means, we sometimes overstep our bounds. Let me say it again. Just because we're free in Christ doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. So look at these questions. And if you cannot say yes to, these, to the question, is it edifying? Or you cannot say no to the questions, can it lead to bondage or addiction? Or will it cause someone else to stumble in their faith? Then you need to avoid the gray area behavior. Here's what you can do instead. Philippians 4.8. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, tells us this. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there be any excellence, if there, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Amen. If you are considering going to see the movie Fifty Shades of Grey, I would encourage you to let that go. More than that, I would encourage you to be very careful in the gray areas of life. Let the Holy Spirit be your God.